The Making of 253 Matilda Season 2 A Documentary by Ambassador 5 Where's Ambassador 1? His Microsoft Azure Neural Voice 3 credit ran out, making him far too expensive to have around. Oh, it's lucky Season 2 took him away from the asteroid so he won't be needed again. Indeed. Care to give us a quick summary of what else happened in Season 2, to refresh the minds of our listeners? It begins 22 years after the first season, with 253 and Matilda approaching the Tau Ceti system. Salish Peters gets in trouble while testing the deceleration ship that's meant to take a special someone into the system to study its worlds. Meanwhile, a strange alien artifact is discovered deep in the mines, and it saps Detective Amadi. As Amadi recovers, it begins to behave oddly, engaging in sabotage on behalf of an approaching alien ship whose species has buried the artifact thousands of years ago. Marcus Flint is selected to explore the Tau Ceti system and sets off, discovering too late that Amadi stowed away with him. They explore the Examoon Eddington, where they meet hallucinations, and the Super Earth Miranda, where they meet plant people. Meanwhile, back on Matilda, Aliens invade and take much of the crew with them when finally chased away. Their parting gift of a relativistic kill vehicle can only be stopped by the mayor making the ultimate sacrifice. You make it sound so simple. The season brought us a lot of new characters, did it not? From the abrasive Jim O'Hara, to the cheerful apprentice Trojo, to the insightful astronomy chief Lawrence, and the unfortunate Ava Hernandez. And you were particularly pleased or surprised with? I enjoyed writing O'Hara. A chance to have somebody who doesn't fit the mold of everybody getting along with and respecting each other all the time. But Tojo was the one who surprised me. It felt like a fairly small utilitarian role when I was writing, but I was really happy with how the performance brought out a lot more personality than I was expecting. Let's hear from Gwyneth Knight, who played Apprentice Tojo. Hey there, this is Gwyneth Knight. In 253 Matilda, I got to play Apprentice Farrah Tojo. She was a delight to bring to life. As soon as I got the role and read the scripts, I thought Tojo and Kaylee from the TV show Firefly would have gotten along famously. So I tried to give Tojo a similar cheerful attitude, like Jewel Strait gave to Kaylee. I wanted Tojo to remain positive even in desperate situations. I think one thing that makes the show so exciting to listen to is the realism and the science. The script is smart, and so is Tojo. I love working on audio dramas like this because it gives me a chance to do my very favorite thing, act. As we're recording, Paul asks for a few takes of each line read in different ways, so it's always fun to hear which takes he chose and how it goes along with all the other voice actors' lines. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about me or hear more of my work, check out my website, GwynethKnight.com, or you can find my page on Facebook, Gwyneth Knight VO. Thanks for listening. For the record, I was thinking generally of the eagerness and innocence of youth, and I didn't consciously base Tojo on Kaylee, but I like Kaylee, so it absolutely works for me. And I'm sure Tojo would love to be Kaylee, tinkering with a little ship all the time. I envy you both for getting to live and work in that compact marvel of a ship we built. With 22 years having passed, a lot of the returning characters became rather old. Aging seemed to be a recurring theme. When I set out to do a series that had spanned 40 years, one of the things I was looking forward to was getting to explore different stages of the lives of the characters and how they cope with age. As we open Season 2, the ex-mayor is struggling to deal with being past his prime. I'm old. I don't have many years ahead anyway. I haven't had a purpose here for 22 years. I've just been rotting away. A discarded memory nobody wants to think about. We see him find various ways to make himself useful again, and ultimately volunteer himself to try to help the people he cares about escape, setting an example for his daughter in the process. But who can we send on that mission, knowing they may never make it back? I'll do it. Dad! It makes sense. I understand the mission, and I'm old enough, I have less to lose. There's just no way to know. Except to try. This long-shot plan is the only idea we have right now. 
and they're going to take somebody next. Might as well be me. On the other hand, we see Salish Peter seeming content as he ages. Because he's still useful. The notion of being useful, or used, comes up a lot. Yes, it's also part of Arash Mahdi's journey. He becomes a helpless tool carrying out actions he despises, betraying his wife especially, and everyone else as well. How am I supposed to live with this guilt? With the memories of what you've made me do, especially to my wife? Tell me about it. How does it make you feel? Like a tool? Used? Have you considered that being used is a compliment? It means somebody found you useful. I'd rather have gone on being called useless. A boring job is a lot better than being used by you. I didn't know how good I had it. The worst thing that could possibly happen to a person is to not be used for anything by anybody. Someday, you'll thank me for using you, even though you didn't want to be used by anybody. Hey, you stole that last line from Kurt Vonnegut's The Sirens of Titan. The ultimate novel on the subject, in which Malachi Constant learns his whole life has been manipulated in service of a petty task. But at least he was useful to somebody for something, and that's better than not being useful at all. This gets into the wider theme of a need for meaning in life. Marcus Flint is another character who struggles with that, drifting through his life until he sees the Tau Ceti mission as a last opportunity to give it purpose. What I'd like to know is, why do either of you want to do this? What else is left for me? My daughters hate me, my boss barely tolerates me, and nobody else gives me the time of day. I figure this is my last chance to make something of my life, and a sacrifice that can help make up for some mistakes. Yes, different characters find their meaning in different places. The ex-mayor and Renata have a driving need to matter and to control things. Salish Peters finds meaning with his family and work. Sergei Kochigan thinks it's all about swashbuckling adventure. Juliana Sanders rediscovers her meaning and a chance to get back to Earth. There's a lot of sacrifice and redemption going on, in different ways with the ex-mayor, Renata, Marcus, and Armadi. Would you like to offer a sacrifice for the fire? No. I think offering the rest of my life is enough of a sacrifice. May I ask, Marcus, do you believe in God? Is this a Christian message? Oh, you're welcome to take it that way. But the religion of 253 Matilda is an amalgam of world religions, with a priest who's deliberately vague because he has to serve everyone. Personally, I'm an atheist, but I enjoyed bringing the religious element into this world with an insightful priest who often acts as a sort of second therapist who can be more direct with people because of his role. Let's talk about the alien invasion. It is perhaps remarkable that even the characters being conquered and imprisoned by them acknowledge that these invaders are not bad guys. Leaving primitives with the power to destroy planets or dictate terms to the galaxy is not an option. We have no intention of using 253 Matilda as a weapon. We'll do whatever we can to prove that we're peaceful explorers. You cannot guarantee the behavior of those who have not yet been born. This is a conflict where both sides have good intentions. That's how a lot of real-life conflicts are, if you can view them from the outside. So I wanted to bring that type of realism instead of the typical black-and-white kill-the-bad-guys. Some of the aliens are killed. Just stay right there, you two. Gotcha! Is this not morally problematic? Yes, it is morally problematic. But how do you fight a war where nobody dies? You can try, and they try hard, but it's not going to work. Could the people not simply surrender rather than take innocent lives? People have a right to defend what's theirs, what their ancestors for over a century have devoted themselves to that's being snatched away just as they were about to accomplish the main mission goal their whole world was made for. And the aliens have their responsibility to confiscate this danger before it can imperil the galaxy. Both sides have valid reasons to fight. Is this galactic police your solution to Fermi's paradox? I don't know if there are any large asteroids traveling at 75% of the speed of light out there, but if there are, anybody watching is going to be very concerned about the implications. 
Because any civilization that can do that can wipe out any other civilization in the galaxy whenever it wants to, and probably needs to be stopped before it can, resulting widespread planetary destruction and remaining species trying not to be noticed is one way to solve Fermi's paradox. But personally, I think there's simply no reason to expect other species to be visiting us because of how absurdly big our galaxy is and how short a time there's been any indication that the Earth might have intelligent life. There's really no reason to expect omnidirectional signals that are going everywhere that give away the location of a home planet either. If species are communicating with each other across space, I would assume it's on very tight, direct beams, and they've yet to see any reason to consider us an interesting planet to transmit to. If I had to guess... I'd say any aliens out there with the capability to reach us or even transmit to us are looking for remote indicators of a higher civilization than ours before they waste their time and resources on us. I concur that humans are primitive savages. So, what other science was involved in making Season 2? There were a lot of tough calculations involved this time around. Figuring out the details of the accelerations involved in getting them to the Tau Ceti system in approximately 20 years, like I had in mind. Originally, I was going to have it be 18 years between the seasons, but that turned out to not quite give enough time to work for all the other factors I had in mind, so I ended up having to stretch it to 22 years. All the timings and velocities on the Peter's rescue plan. Figuring out a realistic balance of survivable acceleration and reasonable time frame for the deceleration ship to Miranda and Eddington. The timings for the alien ship approach. Calculating the relativistic kill vehicles. Even figuring out what year Earth's transmissions would be from had me confused for a bit. So you broke out a calculus textbook and worked through all the equations by hand? Well, I spent a lot of time plugging different numbers into relativistic travel calculators I found online. Are you sure you got all aspects of relativistic travel correct? Uh, moderately confident? I felt like I knew relativity reasonably well before I started. I've read several books on it in the past. But once I got into the details, suddenly everything stopped feeling intuitive. If they could see us, it looked like we're walking around in slow motion now. Time is passing at different rates, here versus there. Relativity gives me a headache. How real is the description of the Tau Ceti system? What you're seeing here is the grand overview. All 12 planets, 87 known moons, the dust belt, the scattered disk. Not to scale, or most of the planets and all the moons would be too small for you to see anything of. Each of these worlds is fascinating in its own right and we could spend a lifetime studying any of them. It's a real solar system. The planet called Miranda in the story is Tau Ceti B2. It's really a potentially habitable super-Earth with approximately the described gravity and other details. Eddington is more fictional because we haven't confirmed any exomoon detections yet, let alone whether they're habitable. But the planet Eddington orbits is real. The frequent eclipses described would be real. The strange seasons would be real if the moon exists. And it's quite reasonable that a moon beyond the normal habitable zone could be warm enough due to tidal heating. Are the aliens real too? Well, Drina, the alien pet on Eddington, is really a raccoon sound effect. What about the two new intelligent alien species introduced in Season 2? For the Mirandans, I just wanted to get as alien as possible. So my mind went to Triffids. What does it look like? It has a circular bowl covered with leaves, which at present is 210.5 centimeters in circumference. From it springs a stem which is 82 centimeters in circumference and 120 centimeters in height from the bowl. The whole plant standing 210 centimeters from the ground. Yes, that's very thorough. Now tell me what it looks like. Oh, like a kind of shaggy leafy giraffe with no legs. What? And the leafy calyx, where the head would be. I'm sorry, it's not a very good description. Oh, yes, it is. Has it got four twiglets growing straight up from the base of the stem? Yes. And inside the calyx, a coil thing which might be a stamen? Yes, that's it. Indeed it is. 
For the invaders, I'd caution that we don't really know much about their culture because all we see are their cops. You can't judge all of humanity based solely on what you experience being arrested by the LAPD. But arrogance is certainly one of their primary features with some justification. Never imagined anything like that. Our technology has been developing for 10,000 years longer than yours. And I wanted to make them non-humanoids while giving them their own voice this time, unlike the Satarians. I made the voice sound effect for the invaders just by doubling the audio track and making one track higher pitched and the other track lower pitched and then remixing them. For season two, you run a Kickstarter. Why? I wanted to be able to pay the actors who've brought the story to life a little something and to be able to honestly, technically call myself a professional writer and producer. Did you enjoy doing the Kickstarter? It reminded me how hopeless I am at marketing anything and how much I don't enjoy doing it. Would you say it was successful or unsuccessful? Did the results surprise you? Moderately successful and very surprising. I was expecting lots of very small donors, but it turns out that offering the world for a dollar wasn't actually tempting many people. Three people backed for one dollar, the other six put in surprisingly large amounts of money. We had nine total backers. I also made tons of different reward levels that I thought would be really tempting great deals, but the only thing people seemed to care about was the name a character reward. Why Kickstarter and not Patreon? Because Patreon means the marketing misery is year-round. With Kickstarter, it's only a month. Plus, I'd hate it to become one of those podcasts where every episode starts with three minutes of telling you to subscribe and pay them more. With all these aliens and adventures and incredible speeds, would you say season two is less plausible than season one? Each season of 253 Matilda gets a bit less plausible than the previous. A 780 year mission is downright likely someday. A 22 year interstellar trip is pretty hard to imagine a sufficient fuel for, and 0.1g acceleration of an asteroid requires some pretty extreme measures. And the terrain. So smooth. And those hills. Breathtaking. It used to be littered with boulders. We had to melt the surface to give it a structural integrity to handle our acceleration. But it's physically possible. In season three, we'll see some more possible but unlikely, and also one plot element that isn't possible in my opinion, although others may disagree. But I hope the carefully prepared bed of realism will make it feel possible. Will I be in season three? Yes, you will. Surely that's impossible, considering I was saved by the kind aliens and put into hibernation for my return to my home planet. Am I the impossible element? Sort of. You'll find out this winter. Who would you say are the primary characters in season three? I'm still writing it, but so far Salish Peters and Fira Tojo have the most lines. There's also interesting subplots developing for Larissa Flint, Chief Lawrence, and Ava Hernandez. Besides myself, will any of the other characters who got taken to the alien asteroid appear in the third season? Most of them will have brief appearances, but in a different way from Ambassador 5. What about Arashamadi and Marcus Flint? I have small roles in mind for both of them in the eighth episode of season three, but I haven't actually written it yet. Who's there now? Mayor Hu was elected shortly after the events of Season 2 and continues to serve in that role. Is that the Season 1 communications chief Hu? No, different character. Are you sure the third season will be the final season? There were always three distinct interesting time periods in the mission that I wanted to explore, and there's really nowhere else to go after this. As we begin the third season, they're turning off the engines for the final time and we'll spend the rest of eternity speeding through the void at a hair short of the speed of light, with no possibility of ever slowing down. Wouldn't that be a better place to end the season than to begin it? I have my reasons. So what year does it take place? That depends where you are. From the perspective of the people on 253 Matilda, it's the year 2240, 20 years after the second season. But on Earth, and for the people like Marcus and Arash and Ambassador 5 who were left behind elsewhere, hundreds of thousands of years have passed. What? That's what happens when you fly close enough to the speed of light. Could they really do that? 
Certainly. It's like Larissa said back in season one. In theory, at a constant acceleration of less than half a G, one could cross the entire galaxy through billions of star systems in a single lifetime. Albeit hundreds of thousands of years from Earth's perspective. I'm not saying that we'll actually do that. We'd run out of fuel, and collisions with interstellar gas would start to become massive explosions. There are those two major difficulties Larissa mentioned, but they both have solutions of sorts in Season 3. You can explore the whole galaxy in your lifetime, but since that's hundreds of thousands of light years, you can't keep the planet-based people you left behind from crumbling to dust as you go. The famous twin paradox. So, what are things like on Earth so far into the future? Very different. Will we find out how? Yes, Earth actually plays a much bigger role this time in Season 3. That seems utterly impossible given what you've said. It's actually quite plausible, but I'm glad you can't see how yet. Is that all you can reveal? I don't want to spoil anything. But as we go, let's leave you with the first teaser trailer for Season 3. This is the planet Earth calling. Oh, damn. Quiet. In the 22nd century, the people of 253 Matilda took humanity's first steps into interstellar space. As you know, our world is a sort of conglomeration of different proto-asteroids which have differing composition. It's my duty to ensure that nothing I do today imperils the next 682 years. Our current always-on engines accelerate the immense mass of our world at around a millimeter per second per second, which may sound slow, but it's got us going pretty damn fast after 92 years. They reached for the stars and made it there. Rather than just describe the Tau Ceti system, let me show it to you. What you're seeing here is the grand overview. All 12 planets, 87 known moons, the dust belt, the scattered disk. Each of these worlds is fascinating in its own right, and we could spend a lifetime studying any of them. Peters, I'm pretty sure you can't hear me, but I'm proceeding with launch. Take off sequence initiated. They were tested. Here they come. Watch over. This is all so senseless. I know you did your best. And they survived. Congratulations, us. We win. If you've been successful, if you've made discoveries, then our purpose was achieved and everything we lost was worth it. Now 40 years have passed since you met them. Their journey is drawing to a close. As I press this button, the outer ring of engines dies. Now ring four. Three. Two. And finally, it's done. Our acceleration has ended. Two fifty three Matilda, the final season, coming January twenty twenty four.